everyone's registered for the event. Um, the way that this will work is that we will um, have some introductions, tell you a little bit about our program, um, and I'm gonna make some introductions to uh, people within the department, and you'll get to meet a lot of different people within the different programs in the residency, uh, both on the diagnostic and interventional sides, and a lot of the kind of unique programs that we have within uh, the residency itself. Uh, we do have a lot of residents here as well that will help us with our Q&A at the end. Uh, and for those of you that submitted questions um, during the RSVP, we'll try to answer those during the, the, the session. Uh, but the chat box is also open. So please feel free to type questions in there. We'll have faculty and um, residents um, keeping an eye on the chat room and answering questions as well. Um, so again, uh, welcome to our diagnostic residency. Um, we are one of the largest um, programs um, in the country. We have 18 residents per year, uh, 14 diagnostic and four interventional residents. Uh, we cover a couple of different sites throughout the city of Atlanta. Uh, and it's unique in that we are really the only um, diagnostic radiology training program in the city. Uh, so you kind of get to see and do everything uh, as a resident here. Um, you know, obviously everything from Grady, our level one trauma center in our large county hospital. Um, to our tertiary care center at Emory University Hospital and in Midtown, uh, and of course the Children's Hospital as well. So those are our main sites. Um, we do cover some other smaller satellite sites as well, but those are the main sites that our residents rotate through. And of course you get experience in every single radiology subspecialty you can imagine, and all the attendings that you work with uh, on a kind of day-to-day -day basis one-on-one -on -one, are also all subspecialty attendings as well. Uh, and really what makes our residency what it is, is I think the people, and you'll get to meet a lot of the residents today, but, but this is really them. Um, some of this was obviously pre-pandemic and pre-COVID, um, but uh, the people is what, especially the residents, this is what makes the program special and what it is. Uh, these, the residents are amazing people. They come from all backgrounds, all walks of life, uh, but they develop this really strong camaraderie uh, and relationship uh, during their time here uh, and really become, I think, lifelong friends. And um, I'm, I hope you'll get to meet a bunch of them today and they'll answer your questions. Uh, but I think this is what makes our program special is, is our residents. Uh, I'm gonna start the program off now introducing some people. And then um, they're gonna just say a few words, introduce themselves, talk a little bit about um, the program. And then a majority of the time um, after that, we'll spend kind of doing a Q and A session for everyone too. Um, if you haven't already, check out our website and our Twitter page. Um, the website on the left, you see a lot of more information about the department, kind of things happening within the department, a lot of great information and videos about the residency as well. And if you haven't, follow our Twitter page. Our uh, social media gurus post constantly, and you'll kind of get and see kind of awards and accolades and kind of things happening around the department and within um, the city of Atlanta as well. All right, I let's see. I don't know if I saw Dr. Meltzer join yet. Yeah. Oh, that's great. There's so many faces. I couldn't keep track. There are so many faces. <laughs> great to see everybody and on a Saturday. Um, so welcome to those visiting. Uh, I'm going to mention two aspects of the program. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about, uh, you know, incredible diverse training, uh, the sense of community. Um, so two aspects. One is uh, something we're really proud of, and that's an adopt a resident program. So we started that years ago where uh, faculty, alumni, friends of the department will uh, donate funds. And we're usually able to do one or two a year, I think two last year for sure. Um, offer uh, a competitive scholarship to have a, a mentored program through the four years of your training. And usually the applications are sort of halfway in the first year. And uh, the, the, the projects people have done have been incredible. So, you know, that goes along with supporting you for your career development to come. And uh, the most fun thing for me is uh, monthly, I have lunch with the residents, although um, in COVID, it's been a little struggle to actually eat together. 
Um, and we talk about, you know, everything. I, I like to uh, bring up controversial topics facing uh, us in medicine, health policy, ethics, et cetera. And sometimes we just have listening sessions and I uh, listen to what the residents, uh, what they're concerned about, what they want to see more or less of. So um, indeed, the residency is the jewel of our program. And welcome to all of you who are visiting us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Meltzer. Um, I also want to next introduce Dr. Mark Mullins, who is one of our neuroradiologists and also our vice chair of education, and as he likes to put it, a uh, recovering program director as well. Yeah, so I'm assuming a radiologist pose, so I'm using a dictaphone uh, just to make you all feel very comfortable this afternoon. Welcome, everybody. Um, Chris, do you mind to go to the next slide for me, please? Um, I wanted to introduce you to our education mission. Um, pretty big. Uh, we've got four residencies, DR, IR, nuclear medicine, and medical physics. We've got practically every kind of fellowship that you could come up with. Um, and if you can come up with one that we don't already have, I'm, gl I'm glad to talk about it. Um, we've got a required clerkship in radiology for our medical students at Emory. And then we also have lots and lots of electives and different kinds of courses and, and um, you know, things like that. We have... Um, part of the transitional year uh, within our department. So um, that is not the entire first year class, but it's a piece. And we have a program director uh, within the group as well. And then we have a very robust visiting professor in Graham Brown's program. And we have a fantastic uh, library system as well. So big, um, lots of resources. So you would probably expect that from a big place. And we certainly have that. Um, but what I, I also want to point out that even though we have a lot of fellows here, that the residents get lots and lots and lots of attention. So part of being spread out, uh, which we are, is that you get lots of opportunities to work one on one with attendings. So there's lots of that as well. So just because we have lots of fellows, don't think that the fellows are always going to be in the way and it's going to be fellow driven. So don't worry about that. Um, certainly, there are going to be situations where, you know, rotations have lots of fellows. And I think you'll find them to be a strong positive. So don't just take my word for it, ask the residents as well. Um, you know, you're gonna hear a lot about the program today. I won't belabor it. Um, I think, you know, people commonly wanna know two things, you know, what brought you here and what keeps you here. So I think that um, this place has, uh, you know, amazing science, amazing clinical practice, amazing people. So the culture here is next level special. So collegial, collaborative, friendly, but does not come at the cost of excellence. So we have some of the best and brightest here. They just act like really nice, useful, you know, helpful people. So um, anyway, welcome. Thanks for coming on a Saturday. Um, I'm glad to answer questions in the chat if you have anything you want to talk about. Thanks, Mark, for introducing the program. All right, next, uh, three of the most important people here today. Uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, current academic year's chief residents, um, Dr. Julie Cronin, Dr. Shanice Gilliard, and Dr. Milan uh, Nguyen. And if you guys wanna say a few words, go for it. They'll have, they're gonna be leading our question and answer session at the end as well. Sure thing, just wanted to say welcome to everybody. I think Shanice and Milan um, are gonna be joining us if they haven't been able to yet. Hello. Yeah, I'm here, Julie. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so we're looking forward to answering all your questions and um, having you here. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, it's really a pleasure to be a part of this interview season, and we look forward to answering your questions at the end of the session. I'll just pop great. in and say I'm here as well. So good to meet you all. Hi, right, thank you. All right. Uh, next, I'm honored to introduce Dr. Omari Johnson. Uh, Omari is uh, the director of our ETI division and also our uh, relatively newly minted vice chair of diversity, equity, inclusion. And he's going to talk a little bit about our DEI programs within the department uh, and, and the School of Medicine and, as a whole, too. Um, Dr. Johnston. Thank you, Dr. Ho, for the invitation and welcome, everyone. I want to join the chorus. It's so great to see such a great group of people. Um, for many of you and for many of us, um, the interest in Emory is really about um, an interest in participating in the highest level of care. 
And that really extends to all communities, regardless of their ability to pay, their socioeconomic status, their language preference, their race, their gender. It is really all communities. And in order to provide that quality care, it requires quality people, staff, faculty, learners. And so we're on this journey um, and we are partnering with the School of Medicine, with the university, with healthcare to really provide cross-cultural and competent-based care and really being able to be leaders in eliminating healthcare disparities. So what does that mean on a day-to-day? -day? I wanna talk and pick up where Mark left off around what we're trying to create within our community. So really the work of diversity, equity, and inclusion is everyone's work. Uh, next slide, slide, please. And while the program is large and the department is either, even larger, we do have a group of people, about 30 people who are dedicated and have signed up for lots of extra work with the DEI committee. And you'll see people on here who are vice chairs, who are faculty, who are chief residents, who are all across the department. So the commitment is certainly there and the work is big. Next slide, please. And when we talked to the group, we thought about what is it that we wanna focus on? So part of what we're developing within the community are areas within education, policy, data, communications, and affinity groups. Now I'm just gonna really blast through this quickly, but if there's other questions, please feel free to tap me in the chat. Next slide. So when we talk about education, we're doing things like unconscious bias training that has been rolled out to all of our um, trainees. I and mean, we'll continue to do that on a regular basis. And we've got things like the diversity toolkit, which provide information for people who want to learn more, people who are looking to resolve conflict or understand what microaggressions look like in the workplace. Um, all of these things are sitting within the educational uh, work that we're doing. Next slide, please. We also have work with policy procedures and operations. So we think about all the things that we're doing. We want to infuse DEI into our policy review, how we recruit. Um, as it relates to the residency, we really looked at how our process can be as unbiased as possible. Um, everyone who interviews will be going through conscious or sorry, implicit bias training as part of our leveling the playing field. So we really do take this seriously and we do, and we are working toward really creating a leadership competency so that everyone who is kind of in charge of anyone is really understanding how important DEI is and we're working to infuse it in everything that we do. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the data outcomes research, we're really looking at performance metrics, um, dashboarding, um, as well as partnering with our vice chair for research and finding scholarship and funding. I'm um, really taking trainees, junior faculty who are interested in DEI research and helping them to support a career, a scholarship career that might live in this space. Next slide, please. Uh, the communication within a large department is a challenge. We really do want to bring information to people and really connect. So you'll see us on social media. We've got a website that has all sorts of great links for support. Um, and then we're, big, we're getting to work on community discussions to really bring folks together. Um, and that's all learners um, within the community. Next slide, please. Uh, we have a group that's working on the affinity group. So we work with and kind of team up with the heritage months that are celebrated and we bring that information back into the group. And then the last slide is really just um, our work that we're doing um, really encompasses quite a bit. So if you're interested, please do follow us as Chris mentioned at, at Emory Radiology. Um, our website is here, all sorts of resources. Really do invite you all to, to check us out um, and know that really we are building and fostering this inclusive and supportive community. Um, the work is everyone's. And I will do a shameless plug for those who are going to be joining us. We always need more trainees on our team. So feel free to reach out to me. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for introducing our DEI efforts. Uh, and it's a big uh, drive within our department. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bill Majdalani, who is our program director for the Integrated and Independent Interventional Radiology Programs. Thank you, Chris. Bill, whenever you're ready, thanks. Well, it's my pleasure uh, to be here and, and talk a little bit about IR. We um, have one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, program in the country, um, including four integrated trainees uh, a year, as well as six independent trainees a year. Um, the scope of the practice is quite broad, um, given the fact that we cover uh, a very busy uh, trauma center, a transplant center, and have rotations uh, in various electives that are unique to Emory, as well as the fact that we take care of so many different uh, types of patients uh, throughout our practice. Um, and necessarily, uh, the types of patients that we take care of at different hospitals 
uh, broaden the uh, knowledge base uh, and procedure base that you're able to offer to those patients. Our education uh, leadership in IR is, is led uh, by my partners, um, uh, Chris, uh, who, who you guys have had the pleasure of hearing from already, as well as Zach Berku and Nima, who serve as my associates, and um, Dr. Mo Loya, who's an assistant program director, and of course, our program coordinator, our foundation is uh, Renita McDowell. Um, as I said, the combined IRDR program is a five-year program. Um, our first full match um, was in 2017, where we have uh, four trainees a year. And that group uh, that we matched in 2017 um, is in uh, their next to last year this year and will be uh, graduating um, after next year. Um, the other pathways that are available to IR for you uh, at Emory include the ESIR pathway, should you match in DR and then decide to pursue IR. That's the early specialization in IR uh, pathway. And uh, after you complete that pathway during your DR training, you spend one additional year in IR, either at our program or another program after going through a match, as well as the six independent IRs per year. Let me go to the next slide, please. And here's our uh, group of uh, integrated IR residents. Um, starting um, in uh, uh, top left is Moel Syed, who is in his uh, final year of training here and will be uh, the second graduate from our integrated IR uh, program. And then our first full match in 2017 um, in the top right, uh, Julie Cronin, uh, Nina Davison, Mangala Patel, and Tina Sankla, who will be uh, in their final year of IR training uh, next year. We obviously have a a tremendous group from top to bottom. We're proud of all of them and uh, looking forward to all of their success. We certainly make time for a fun outside of work, um, whether we're having our brunches at Midtown, um, of course, pre-COVID and, and uh, visiting the museums, doing our hikes, um, having our brunches and get togethers at various meetings, including uh, weddings and um, our morning rounds that we do every day, as well as our didactics on a weekly basis. So we like to uh, work hard and we like to have a, a lot of fun um, within our group, as well as the whole Emory family. Well, thanks, Dr. Majdalani, um, for uh, sharing the IR program with everyone. And uh, we'll also be available for questions at the end, too. So thanks, Bill. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Krapinski and Dr. Brent Weinberg, who are co-chairs of the uh, research track in our program. Uh, I believe Dr. Weinberg is here today, so I'll hand it over to Brent. Hi, Chris, and thanks for the introduction, and uh, thanks to everyone for coming in here. I think I only have one slide today, uh, just to tell you a little bit about the research track. Uh, the research track is a, a subset of the diagnostic residency for uh, two residents per year and we interview you as a supplement in terms of, uh, so when you have your diagnostic interview, we have a short additional interview in the afternoon to interview for the research track. And the goal of the research track is to prepare people to be ready for an academic career. Uh, so it's for people who are interested in going into academic radiology and having a significant research component. And part of what that track offers you is the tools that you need to get ready for that career. And the key one, and we, the one we think is the most important is protected research time during your residency, which amounts to about one day uh, out of four weeks in your first year, and then uh, about 20% time or one, one day per week or four days per month during your uh, years two through four. Uh, with the goal of during those times, you develop an independent research project, identify a mentor and, uh, and work on those projects so that you're uh, ready to submit abstracts, write papers, and uh, submit some grant applications. Uh, we're kind of increasing the resources that we're having for our residents in terms of getting some office space and the computer support, uh, because we want you guys to have all the resources that, uh, that are necessary. Um, as part of the research track, you have the capability of interacting with any of the researchers in our own department, as well as any of the researchers throughout the School of Medicine. And I, I saw one of the questions which came up in the chat was, about informatics and if people have the capability to work with informatics and also work on AI projects. Uh, we both have an informatics division within the radiology department, as well as a very strong bioinformatics division uh, as part of the uh, School of Medicine, which is a separate department in the School of Medicine. And a lot of our residents have chosen to work with uh, uh, investigators in those, in those sections, uh, either as co-investigators or, or otherwise. And AI is certainly an exciting trend that a lot of people are getting involved in. And we have uh, researchers both in our department and otherwise who are doing a lot of projects on that. 
Uh, so many people do uh, choose to get involved uh, in that. I'm happy to take any questions later about the research track, or you, you can reach out to me uh, separately, but just thanks to all of you guys for coming. Thanks, Brent. All right, next, I'm going to introduce um, Dr. Ryan Peterson and Dr. Samir Turbaran, who are co-directors and co-chairs of the clinical educator track. And I believe Dr. Turbaran's here today. Hello, good afternoon. And um, we can go on to the next slide. I see Ryan and, and I as more as, as guides to particularly residents who may like to teach or love to teach. And so, so the education track uh, is an excellent opportunity and we can go into the next slide for those interested. Um, we, we see it as an opportunity to build future radiology educators. And what that entails is, next slide, our different um, small group series or lately webinars, but it's live uh, with different faculty of different topics, which you'll see on the next slide, but we'll have practicum activities and a capstone projects, but we'll dive into the small group series next. So we have varying topics, adult learning theory, as you can see here, uh, and we have master educators who teach this uh, within our faculty, all these different skill sets and um, wide variety uh, throughout the four years. And this is a track that will continue throughout all the residency and open to both DR and IR as well. In the next slide, I think we talk about the practicum activities where you have many opportunities to teach uh, and varying levels. So not just within the residency or with medical students, but with advanced practice providers as well, including nurse practitioners, um, PAs. And as you can see, we have many opportunities. So the uh, next slide talks about, or just brings up the capstone and, and if we could list all of them, there are just so many different variety of projects depending on what you're passionate about and what these residents are passionate about. So um, it varies again, depending on the learner type, whether it's providing new material for the medical students um, all the way through to co-teaching with other residents as well as clinical, other clinical faculty or, or staff type level of teaching. So um, with that, I will answer any questions through the chat and as well as at the end of the uh, session. So thank you for all coming. Thank you, Dr. Tuberin. Yeah. And we take uh, just, so it's a longitudinal track throughout your whole four years with us. And we take three residents per year for the clinical educator track. All right. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. David Brandon and Dr. Aaron Grady who are uh, nuclear medicine physicians and directors of the molecular imaging track in medicine or our MIM track, as we call it. Um, I think I saw them both here. So I'll let them take the, take the mic here. Yep, we're both here. Um, and David, feel free to chime in. I'll um, start the process. And um, anyhow, uh, the um, goals of the molecular imaging and medicine program are to develop well-rounded radiologists with expertise in the clinical and research aspect of nuclear medicine and molecular imaging, and also to build a community of physicians um, and scientists. Uh, and we correspond with um, a lot of other trainees within our division, um, and it's a really great community, lots of fun. And um, we also uh, will be training um, everyone who participates in the molecular imaging and medicine track um, to meet both the requirements of the American Board of Radiology and the American Board of Nuclear Medicine, which sets us a little bit apart in that regard. Next slide, please. Um, so we have two flavors of tracks. The first is the MIM-4 track, where it's basically um, a mini fellowship within the four years of the diagnostic radiology residency. And um, then we are developing the clinical leaders in nuclear medicine and um, therapy uh, for academic and large private practices. And we really give a, a strong foundation in molecular imaging research. Next slide, please. And then we have a, an additional year that can be added on for the MIM-5. And this is where we can um, train the molecular imaging and physician scientists of the future. And so this is really exciting. And with our um, uh, HSRB2, the new research building that's being built, we expect to have an enlarging presence and uh, really be more competitive in this space. So um, I think this is something, you know, Emory is definitely more up and coming um, in this area these days. So this is a fun um, and exciting thing. Next slide, please. 
And we have a lot of fun. <laughs> we like to celebrate our community and build community with our nuclear trainees. We have nuclear trainees in the nuclear medicine residency program, and we have two additional um, fellowships, the nuclear radiology fellowship and a molecular imaging and theragnostics fellowship program. So it's a lot of fun um, to um, hang with each other. This is pre-COVID, of course, but um, we also have been doing some um, outdoor activities or um, uh, other things that are virtual um, to build our community. David, anything to add? Oh, this is from our um, uh, welcome party, I think, last year, too. No, I think uh, I think you did a great job. There is a supplemental application uh, yeah. that uh, that you'd have to do, uh, similar to the research track uh, in that. And we're the only, I saw it come up in the chat, we're the only two uh, uh, of those that you apply kind of with your DR uh, residency. But of course, you could apply just to DR as well uh, and then apply separately to us. Yep, for this one, it's very important to complete the um, supplemental application because that's weighted very strongly. Thank you. Thank you all for introducing uh, the MIM track program and, and our uh, wonderful trainees and faculty within the nuclear medicine department. All right, um, next I'd like to introduce Dr. Nabil Safdar, who is our vice chair of informatics. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Welcome, everyone. My name is Nabil Sufter, and I'm here to talk to you about informatics. Many of you are wondering what informatics even is. It's everything having to do with technology. As you know, radiology is a field which leads in healthcare in pushing the barriers and how technology is used. And radiology at Emory I wouldn't say is not only an exception, but I would say is a leader amongst that field. Um, we at Emory have built a strong informatics division. Um, there are probably not, um, uh, I would say it's a fraction of radiology departments at academic medical centers around the country that have an informatics division to begin with. And what that means is we lead operational changes. Radiology at Emory is leading in getting us uh, new packs at Emory, helping with the new electronic medical record, helping with things like a vendor neutral archive with the analytic strategy at Emory in general. So that's very operational, hands on stuff that we're fixing and making better for patient care, for your satisfaction as someone who works here um, and with our partners. But we also do a lot of research. It was mentioned earlier and I saw the, the question earlier that was posed about opportunities to do research. There has always been a lot of traditional fields in research and informatics, but everybody is super excited about the potential for artificial intelligence. And I mean the word excited when I say it. This is not a threat to you or your field or your future career. It's something that's gonna help you. It's something that's gonna make us better able to take care of our patients and work with each other. And when I say that we're leading in artificial intelligence research, I absolutely mean it. Search chest x-ray, vice.com, and artificial intelligence, and you will see a, an article that is highlighting some of our radiologists who've done um, amazing work about the potential influence and interaction of artificial intelligence and health disparities, AI ethics, health equity concerns. Um, and so when we talk about informatics, the, the, the um, misconception might be that these are geeky radiologists, deep in dark offices, the geekiest of the geekiest, right? Because you're radiologists and you're informatics. But really, we're talking about leaders that are getting profiled nationally, internationally. And when they're talking about the impact of AI, AI ethics, the impact on uh, economics and making changes locally. If you look on your screen now, you're gonna see two things which I'd like to highlight. We have an I3T track, which is an integrated imaging informatics track. Um, it's something that in your first year, you would be applied to apply, uh, you would be um, invited to apply for. And in that track, you get a deep um, curriculum in informatics and technology. Also all the leadership skills that go along with making changes in a complex environment like Emory or any other place. We cover operations, entrepreneurship, research, artificial intelligence. And I would say that we have had a really good track record. This year at RSNA, the Radiological Society of North America, two of our current or, or recently graduated trainees are gonna be highlighted in the 
Ari Crown Theater, up to 50,000 people watching, one for the Imaging Shark Tank meeting. This is last year's announcements. The, the new announcement is gonna come out and, and uh, have one of our um, current residents. And the other for the Fast Five presentations from Dr. Chung, who just recently graduated from our I3, I3T informatics track. Um, and her project and her effort really had to do with using simple technology to make a change in Clarkston, which is a nearby town to Emory, a few miles away where there's a large underserved refugee population and how we can take radiology services to, to there, some of the volunteer attendings that read the ultrasounds that are being done in that free clinic are on this call right now. So a lot of excitement and a lot of opportunity for informatics. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Um, radiology is a great field. We're glad to see you all here. Thank you, Dr. Saftar, for introducing the IPT track and also uh, everything amazing that we do in the informatics uh, department. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hernan um, Bello and Dr. Jay Shaw, who are directors of our newly minted global health track. Um, we've had global health uh, opportunities um, here for over 10 years, uh, but now we have a dedicated track in addition to all these other tracks that we have um, that's more of a longitudinal global health track. So um, Dr. Bello, I think I saw you earlier. And Hey, everyone. Thanks, Chris. Sure. Hey, my name is Hernan uh, Bello. I, I was a resident here, did fellowship, and now I started as, a, as faculty. Um, together with Jay Shah and this year's this year, adopt the resident winners, Tisa uh, Khan and Sophia Yeka, we the global track of the program. Um, members of the track have a shared interest in public health. Um, we want to improve access to imaging in low and middle income countries and communities around the world, but also locally. Um, residents in the track have the opportunity to lead local chapters of national and international organizations, such as Rite Aid, Health for the World. They get to create and execute global health projects with the help of supportive mentorship. They get extra hands-on and experience and training with point of care ultrasound. Next slide, please. The Global Health Track is supported in part by the enthusiastic uh, Emory Radiology faculty who work on, on a multitude of diverse global health initiatives around the world. Emory University itself has a large footprint in the global health arena and we have vast resources available to us through the university and the schools of both medicine as well as public health. Um, our goal is to build relationships and collaborations within the university, as well as with Atlanta-based institutions, including the CDC, the Carter Center, among others. Next slide, please. A big cornerstone of the, of the track uh, is the free ultrasound clinic in Clarkston, Georgia. Um, as Nabil was saying, uh, Clarkston is a small city east of Atlanta and it actually ranks number one in the nation for resettling uh, the highest number of refugees per capita. Uh, with, it's, it's a radiologist driven free ultrasound clinic that was started by residents of Emory, um, of our Emory radiology program just last year. Um, it is staffed by volunteers, ultrasound techs, medical students, radiology residents and attendings. And this clinic is actually an amazing collaboration between several of our tracks, including the education, um, the service aspect and the informatics aspect, like um, Dr. Saftar was mentioning. Jay, do, do you have anything to add? We take- uh, I'm really, two I'm really ex excited about uh, the track and having the formal track and kind of like what you said and what Dr. Ho alluded to, I think the best part about formalizing our track is that we're now gonna be able to have lectures from all of the people that are outside of radiology, but centered in global health. And uh, Atlanta is definitely a hub for that. Sorry, I'm speaking from a crosswalk in New York City. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you all for sharing. Uh, we're really excited about this track and kind of formalizing the process now and, and making it a much longer, more longitudinal experience rather than just the, the year that you attend your, your international um, trip. So we're very excited. Thank you again. Well, that pretty much, um, I'd like to say a couple of thank yous first. Uh, thank you to all of our faculty and residents for showing up on a Saturday afternoon and um, telling you a little bit about our department. I hope you were able to get a feel for the department. 
Um, also, thanks to um, our coordinator, uh, um, Amy Fioramonte, who helped set up this whole thing and all the RSVPs. So we appreciate that. Uh, and again, thank you all for you for joining us and asking questions. Um, you know, I wanted to spend a majority of the time answering questions. And so that's why we kind of made the introductions short. Uh, I know we have a lot of different programs and a lot of different opportunities. And hopefully you got a feel for some of them today. And I saw in the chat as well, take a look at the website. We have a lot more information about all the different tracks we talked about today and even more opportunities than we've, than we've listed here today. And you'll also get a good listing uh, of all of our residents uh, in the program and, and uh, kind of see the diversity within our program itself. So the, this um, Q&A session is gonna be kind of split into two. I'm gonna do kind of like the, the PD Q&A uh, relevant questions first. And then I'm going to turn it over to the residents to do the, the resident Q&A. Um, but I have some of the questions here. So these are the questions that uh, some of you all submitted um, during the RSVP. So I've kind of chunked them into sections. And I'll do my best to answer them quickly here so we can get on to the residents. Um, so you know, you know, what type of applicant are you looking for in your program? And this is a, it's a tough question, but I think it's uh, what makes us a great program is there's not necessarily one type. We're not looking for someone that's, you know, just all straight A's and you know 280s on boards, or I, I don't even know if that score is possible, but we want a really, uh, we, we look at your application in total, right? It's a very much a holistic review. We want you to have balance in your application. We want you to have service and leadership uh, and other things you're passionate about. You know, you're obviously there, you know, grades and scores are part of it, but I would say that's a very small part of your application. Uh, we wanna see the research you've done. We wanna see what passions you have. Uh, we wanna learn why you're interested in radiology. So that's the, the things that we're looking for in your application. Uh, so you know, when we meet you, we wanna see if you're a good fit for us and if we're a good fit for you as well uh, during that, that interview process. Um, so you'll know, again, you'll, if you look at all of our residents, there's not a mold they necessarily fit. Uh, I think, you know, in terms of where they come from or their backgrounds or their schools, um, the mold they fit is they're just awesome people. Uh, they, they, we love them, they work hard um, and they just really gonna give their all to um, the training and then to the community at large here at Emory and in Atlanta. Um, how many, so this next one's kind of a chunk together about, I guess, um, different backgrounds people come from. Um, we do have, I, I don't know how many osteopathic residents in total we've had ever at our program. We currently have three within our program, if that helps answer that question. Um, but again, we don't treat, when we're looking at applications, we don't look at where you went to medical school, what degrees you have. Uh, and, and part of this lies into the next question. Do you have non-US uh, IMGs in your program? We do, and we've had a lot in the past as well. Uh, and they've been very, very successful. So that is, again, uh, what we're looking for are just the best people for the best fit. It doesn't matter uh, the demographics about those kinds of things. Um, does the year of medical school graduation matter? Uh, not at all. Again, this, I think, contributes to the uniqueness of the program. We've had people that have been out um, and working in industry or working in completely different careers or switching residencies and been in practice. So um, this does not matter. I think it really adds to the, your experiences. Uh, as, as long as, like you said, there's no gaps, we're just looking for people that would be the best fit for us. Uh, the next chunk of questions has to do more with the application itself um, and specifically like step scores and things like that. So we do have a kind of, and obviously the, the um, deadline to look at applications uh, opens on September 27th for us. Um, we have an internal deadline of November 15th of when um, all the applications should be submitted. We start looking at applications as soon as they come in. Um, step two CK is not a requirement um, for the application uh, for interview consideration. So if you haven't taken it or the score's not in, it doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to delay your application waiting for the score unless you want to, but we don't require step two uh, for your application. Uh, and we do not filter candidates based on scores. Um, I will tell you that the based on our applications the last few years, the average step one score is probably at the 240s, but I say average. Uh, we interview everyone uh, from scores, you know, lower than that and scores higher than that. Uh, and it's going to, again, that's a very, very small percentage of your application, uh, but we don't filter candidates based on that. So I hope that helps answer that question. Um, uh, for the research track, I think Dr. Weinberg answered this question already. Um, there is up to 20% protected time during years two through four. And again, it's pretty flexible. Um, that averages out, like you said, to one day a week. 
Um, but some projects uh, require more dedicated time and you know they do have dedicated research blocks and maybe sometimes you need less time. So it's, we can be very flexible uh, about that. And a lot of our residents actually are, have uh, research track have been awarded RSNA research grants or external grants um, that allows them for more protected time. So uh, again, that's the key part of that research track really is the protected time and the mentorship, I think. Uh, and I think um, Dr. Grady and um, Dr. Brandon answered the last question as well uh, in terms of opportunities to do kind of early specialization in nuclear medicine through our MIM track. Um, that MIM track, whether you do the MIM4 or MIM5, does allow for dual certification in both nuclear medicine uh, and diagnostic radiology. So you are able to sit for both of those um, boards. Chiefs or residents, did I miss anything in the chat that I should talk about? before I turn it over to y'all? I think you got everything, Dr. Ho. Yeah, great. Everything. Well, I want to um, thank our faculty. You're welcome to stay for the resident Q&A session. Um, but if you have to leave, I know it's a Saturday afternoon and probably people are busy, that's okay too. I wanna to thank you all for joining um, with us. And, um, but if you'd like to stay, please stay as well. I'll, I'll be here too, um, but I'll turn it over to the chiefs now for the, uh, their Q&A session here. Thank you so much, Dr. Ho. Um, so like I said, oh, I should probably turn on my video, sorry. Um, my name is Julie. Um, I'm one of the chief residents. Um, Shanice and Milan are also here. So um, what we're gonna do is go through questions, just have, we've kind of pre-divided the ones that you submitted beforehand. Um, Shanice will be answering questions. I'll kind of be moderating. One of our residents, Jim is on call. So if he can't answer questions, I'll answer the ones he was assigned. And then Milan will be moderating the chat if y'all have any additional questions. Um, so I think let's get started um, with Christian. Your first question, uh, what does day-to-day -day training of residents look like? And residents, if you want to introduce yourselves as you come on to answer questions, that would be great. All right. Um, I hope my volume's working. If it's not working or if you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, so I'm an R1. I also did my TY year here at Emory. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll periodically be looking. Um, but kind of how my day-to-day -day goes, uh, we normally start around eight and at five, it's a very eight to five sort of day. When you walk in in the morning, you're, uh, you're expected to start looking at overnight uh, studies that have been preloaded by our residents who are um, usually doing solo call or independent calls that they'll talk about more about later. Um, as an R1, I've never really felt, I guess this is now my seventh or eighth week, I've never really felt pressured to clear the list. I'm usually there to learn. I keep getting told like I am getting paid to learn. Um, and that's exactly how it feels. Um, I think a lot of times people have this assumption with bigger programs with a lot of fellows that there's, it's very fellow driven. Um, there are so many studies every day um, that I, um, I'm almost some days very overwhelmed by how many studies there are, but um, with the, the amount of, with the attendings that we're working with, they give me a lot of confidence to kind of just pick up what I can and learn what I can and um, go from there and really trying to use that, those opportunities to learn. Um, so I read usually overnight in the morning. We have conference, dedicated conference time that um, from 12.15 to about 1.15. And then in the afternoon, we're reading the, the inpatient or outpatient or studies that are coming in throughout the day. Um, once the list is uh, at 4.30, once everything's time marked, that's kind of when we start wrapping things up and, you know, I go home and study or I read a little bit before I do it the next day. Um, as an R1, you do take chest call uh, periodically on the weekends, but a lot of times you have the weekends off to study, to recoup, to, you know, focus on yourself. Um, and then uh, we do three week rotations um, and they repeat. So I will have at least two neuro rotations, uh, one at the beginning of the year and one towards the middle end. Um, and I think it'll be that nice continuity to see how I develop over the year that I'm kind of excited to look forward to. Um, that's kind of the gist of it. And if you have any more specific questions, again, I'll be looking in the chat and I'll reply periodically. Awesome, thanks, Christian. Uh, we'll jump to Carlos next. If you wanna introduce yourself, Carlos, and your first question is what separates Emory Diagnostic Radiology from everybody else? Hey guys, thanks for joining us today. I'm Carlos, I'm one of the R2s just off of night float. And so it's kind of nice to be back on days. Um, I did my transition or yeah, my transitional year here as well. So if there's any questions, definitely you can answer those. 
Um, in terms of that question, I think what separates this program, just a little bit of background. Uh, so I originally from San Antonio, Texas, uh, and our program there, the radiology program was a small program. It was about seven to eight residents. And so when I was interviewing, I think I was looking for something that had really good culture of, you know, emphasis on resident education, but also just an emphasis on just being fun and, and having a good time and, and doing what we want to do in terms of learning radiology. And I think that's what separates this program. Having interviewed a couple of Midwest Eastern schools as well as Texas schools was that I really did feel like this culture was one of just uh, a big emphasis on training. Um, I think you saw that from all our, our presenters, from our faculty in the various departments, but also just inclusive. Um, I think that was something that really I found very unique to this, uh, the Emory radiology culture was just very inclusive and they try really hard uh, to push that. Um, and also wellness. I think uh, the residents are one of the greatest resources I think that the program has and you know the upper levels to even our new R1s. I think you know, we see that. And so just the culture, I think that they've developed in this program have been great. Uh, and I've definitely enjoyed my past two years here. And so, like they said, the culture is everything here. And I think that they, it really does show. Awesome. Thanks, Carlos. All right, we'll jump to Jeff next. Your first question is with a large program, what are specific measures that are taken to ensure that every resident feels supported? Um, hi guys. Yeah, um, I hope you guys can hear me okay. Um, I'm I'm an R2 resident. I'm uh, working along with Carlos. We both did our transitional year here as well, and we're glad to answer any questions. Um, I just wanted to briefly tell you why I chose Emory too as well. I all, I definitely second Carlos's opinion about Emory being um, sort of like a large family. We're a big group, but um, we all get along very well. We um, often. Um, especially before COVID, we definitely shared a lot of um, fun times together outside of work. Um, and uh, we all we all work hard every day to um, sort of, you know, get our jobs done, but we have great educational opportunities here. But with a large program, um, I think that as far as support goes, uh, we have several things in place. Um, one, Dr. Ho is one of the, or if the best program director you could ask for. Um, he frequently meets with us. Um, um, on a very frequent basis to make sure that we're doing okay um, over protected noon conference time to ensure that any things that come up in our residency or things that need to be addressed, um, he is there to, you know, figure out what is going on and how he can help. Um, also, Dr. Meltzer does the same thing. So between the two of them, they have been very supportive. Um, I think in addition to that, we, um, we have you know, try to reincorporate uh, with social distancing and outdoor activities, um, some um, social activities between our residents. Um, we definitely are a pretty social group. We do like to do things together, um, but obviously with different um, things going on in the pandemic, it has been somewhat limited. Um, we do a lot of virtual events as well. We've gotten a little creative um, during COVID. Um, but other than that, I, th I think that um, many of us have actually academic days, um, especially those interested in research. I feel like people are very supportive of um, anything that you're doing, especially if it's for a conference, um, if you have um, family time, et cetera, things come up. Um, I feel like, you know, between Dr. Ho, Dr. Melter, and our chief, wonderful chief residents, our chief residents are amazing. Um, we have had, I feel very supported, so I don't think that there's ever been any issues come up and um, you can feel free to email me about any further questions. Um, as far as mentorship, what type of mentorship does the program have? Um, we have several in place um, between attendings and residents and fellows. Um, I have found it personally, to, it's easier for me just to reach out to people personally, especially if they have common interests or things that I'm I'm, you know, overall interested in, especially research or any particular educational opportunities uh, or anything you're just particularly wanting to learn about, um, or even just um, in general, like life, life advice. Um, I think that one particularly that stood out was when I first started my R1 year, um, you know, they pair you with an older resident, often an R2 or an R3 or R4 resident um, that shares some common interests. There's usually a server that goes out beforehand and they try to pair you with someone who does have some similar interests as you, not just um, work-related interests, but things that um, you like to do outside of work and, and overall career goals. 
So I think that's one example. I could list more, but um, I think our residency webpage is also a great resource for any questions that don't get answered today. Um, I found it very helpful when I was applying here as well. Um, the vo what is the volume and breadth of procedures like at Emory? Um, I think that there are unlimited amount of procedures <laughs> to get done. Um, I don't feel at all like fellows are intervening, intervening with any of the procedures that um, are performed here. We have a lot of variation, especially uh, I'm an IR resident. Uh, we have everything you can imagine from um, venous interventions, lim lymphatic in interventions. Um, we have many percutaneous procedures, a lot of oncology procedures. Um, we have many pediatric interventions. I could go on, but um, you could just check out our website for, for further information. I'll stop there. I, I think I'm kind of rambling on a little bit. Sorry, Julie. No worries, Jeff. Thanks for sharing all that with us. I think that all of that is very important for applicants to know about. Um, I'll jump to Shanice next. Um, this question uh, is actually applies to a few residents. So Shanice, after you talk, if anyone else wants to chime in. Um, but I know we already talked about the clinical education track a little bit, but that's what this question is regards to. Um, and this person asks, could residents that are on the CET track speak about their experience? Sure, it's been a fantastic experience um, for me just to hone in my teaching skills, um, learn how to give a lecture that's not super boring um, and engaging and also learning how to incorporate innovative teaching tools into um, different discussions. We also have first dibs on different teaching opportunities throughout the department and then also across different departments at Emory. So for example, we give lectures to the Department of Surgery, as well as medicine. Um, Milan has done a lot with uh, PA students. And then we also give the R1 lectures. Um, that is, I think, was part of a CET project that has become just got uh, instituted into uh, our program um, the, throughout the year. So we have gradual lectures that kind of build up to pre-call um, for the R1s as they get acclimated to radiology. Um, furthermore, it's been great just um, having, you know, Ryan and Verna um, to talk to us about our individual projects and things that we're thinking about as teachers. And we also have lectures from people that are well-recognized educators. And um, that's kind of in our one-on-one -on -one protected time that we get to ask them questions and practice um, in that small group setting. So it's been great. Awesome, thanks Shanice. Do anyone else, does anyone else from the CET? or the, I guess it's not the CET track, just the CET, um, have anything to add? Yeah, sure, I'll jump in. Um, so CET, you do apply in your first year, and I didn't get in my first year, but I was still able to find ways to teach. Um, there's medical student lectures that happen every month, and it's kind of a low stakes way um, to present a topic of interest, like you can teach fourth year elective students how to read a chest x-ray, um, you can also teach in the reading room day by day because there are medical students who rotate with you. So you might have someone at the workstation um, that you'll just have to explain what a CT is, what Houndsville units are. So there's day-to-day -day, um, teaching as well, not just formal teaching. Um, but I joined the CET my second year and yeah, I've had great opportunities to work with um, APPs as well as other residents, as well as medical students. So it's been great fun. Awesome. Thanks, Milan. All right, Jim, I don't know if you're able to answer this question, but if not, I can take it. Um, is resident call independent? So, hey, this is Russell and not Jim. Oh, um, Russell. Hey, thanks. Yeah, we're on call right now at Grady. And yes, I feel <laughs> wow. very independent. I'm making <laughs> um, all these decisions, like many, many decisions. I'm sure you're doing great. <laughs> yeah. So I, I feel like it is independent. But at the same time, there's always somebody that I can reach out to if I need help. So although it feels independent and I do feel like I'm given, you know, opportunities to make independent decisions, um, I don't feel alone, if that makes sense. So I feel like there's a lot of support. Um, there's always somebody that I could reach out to if I feel like I'm in over my head. So, um, but I, I do think the independent call that we have is extremely valuable. Agreed, Russell. Thanks for uh, chiming in. If y'all get too busy, let, me, let us know, okay? We're actually not doing bad. Uh, okay, doing good. Bad. Good. Uh, Glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah, fun to work with. Wonderful. All right, so we'll move to Scott next then. Um, Scott, are there resources and funds for research? 
Hey, um, yeah, so I think I'd like to split this into three different things. There's, um, there are people. So uh, the people here at Emory, the support uh, staff, uh, you know, people that are there to help you um, get all of the budget together for your grant application, uh, people to help you, uh, you know, do a data poll from the clinical data warehouse, uh, research mentors. Um, there's a, just a huge abundance of experts and people to help you uh, really get what you need uh, to help you answer your research questions and uh, move your projects forward. And I find that uh, even just through asking, just asking anybody, uh, hey, you know, I'm trying to do this. Do you know who I can talk to? Everyone is willing to help point you in the right direction. Uh, so really, um, and not only that, there's a lot of, you know, it's very organized in terms of, you know, there's a website with all the research policies and, um, you know, how to do like a data, a data pull from the clinical data warehouse or, um, you know, what you need if you're going to the budget office uh, for your RSNA grant. Um, it's all very well laid out. Um, so it's, it's a, we're a large research university and the research enterprise is, uh, it's like a well-oiled machine here. Um, very, very easy to get what you need to do, uh, get what you need. Um, another thing is, the, as far as people, um, research mentors are really easy to find. If you have any sort of research interest whatsoever, um, there will be someone who uh, will want to work with you uh, and help you take that idea and bring it to fruition. Um, so, so those are the people, and we have funds. So the adopt a resident provides. Um, about $10,000 from what I saw, um, allotted over the four years of residency to cover the costs of sort of your project. Um, so that's something that's like intramural funding, but doesn't necessarily have to be research. Um, it's just, um, say you want to develop a new curriculum or you want to uh, do something on a big global health project. Um, that money is really just there for you know, kind of any big idea that you have. Uh, so that's funding there. And then other funding opportunities. Um, there, we do have at least one person per class who gets our RNA resident uh, research grant money, sometimes two uh, in one class. Um, but we've always been very successful uh, with getting those funds. And I'm not entirely sure of any intramural funds. I was trying to look for some earlier today. Um, if Dr. Weinberg or anyone else uh, on the call knows about any sort of intramural funding for resident research, um, other than working on a project with a mentor who already has funding, I'm not super sure about that. Um, so then also time. So any resident is eligible to receive uh, academic time. So if you want to have an academic day to, you know, work in, say, work with the technologist and you're trying to do some phantom imaging studies, um, you can submit a form to your preceptor. You can request that time off. Um, and um, so you can have that extra time, even if you're not research track or any sort of track, you just want to, you're doing uh, research within the department. And then uh, within the research track, uh, I'm in the research track myself. Uh, you get 20% research time starting your R2 year. That's about 50 days per year. And I definitely don't feel like I'm missing out uh, on any sort of clinical training. Um, we have a lot of volume and case mix here. And the variety here is such that, you know, you could probably work half the number of days and still get a uh, great training. Uh, here at Embry. So um, I really think that, uh, you know, the research track here is a huge, uh, huge benefit of coming here. Um, and it's a great opportunity. I've been super happy with being a part of it. Um, and then my next question. So that's, that's it for my question. Um, there are other questions here. Should I, are you waiting 
I was going to do, um, I was going to do them like one at a time so that everybody had a chance okay. to talk. Um, okay. Thank you, so Scott. That's my exhaustive answer to that. <laughs> We appreciate it. Um, we'll jump back to Christian now. Uh, Christian, can you talk about how readouts are usually done at Emory? Yeah, so um, every day, again, when I go in, um, it's typically a different attending. Um, usually they rotate, so I'll see an attending maybe three or four times during a rotation. But I think uh, just to veer off in a little bit, but um, Having a multitude of attendings I, I'm working with has really, I think is a really good strength of Emory. You get uh, exposure to different dictation styles to kind of determine what your own like radiology style and narrative end up being as you're reading out with these attendings. But typically how readout goes is after you pick up however many studies they want you to pick up in the morning, you usually sit down with them and you go over the studies in, in detail um, while they're pointing out things that you may have missed things that they think are interesting, uh, important findings that um, may not be important to like the big overall finding in the case, but are something that you should look at in every study. Um, and they really go into this one-on-one -on -one detail with you, um, with your studies. At that point, I'm taking notes, I'm um, writing down things that I should include in the report, I'm writing down things on the side that I need to read up on more, which, you know, it's a very long list <laughs> by the end of the day. And then I go back to my workstation and I um, try to reiterate and try to re and try to learn from what happened in readout and try to put that in a in a report in a finalized report. So it's really engaging with my style with my radiology style, uh, making sure that I learned what I was supposed to take away from the study, um, and then um, really hound in deep into um, you know the study and what it was entailing. At that point, I send it off to the attending, who then um, looks over the study, makes edits to my report, um, and then finalizes it. Um, at that point, usually at the end of the day, or maybe the day after, when I have some free time, I look at what the, what the edits were that the attending made, just to see what I what I could have said better. Some you know dictionary words that I need to add to my 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 dictionary, I guess. Um, and then I kind of happens throughout the day. At least it depends on the attending, but definitely more at least two times, if not up to four or five times, depending on the rotation and the attending. But um, I guess to summarize, it's uh, very attending dependent. Um, you have work with a lot of attendings. You read out and then you write the report after the readout, or you edit the report after the readout, and then um, you kind of go from there. Uh, if there's any more specific questions about how readout works, um, Put, feel free to put them in the chat and I'll, I'll answer from there. Awesome, thank you. Um, we'll go to Carlos next. And Carlos, I'm gonna have you answer two questions just because um, we are going over time a little bit and we had a lot of questions about moonlighting. Um, so would you mind first commenting on how family friendly is the program? And then would you mind uh, kind of discussing some of our moonlighting opportunities? Sure, thanks, Julie. Um, so one of, kind of going back to, I guess, what Dr. Ho had mentioned earlier is our class is very diverse and, and our whole program of residents is very diverse. I'm a non-traditional resident. I came to the program with a family of three and a wife of about 13 years. And so our class is, is split like that. We have older individuals we, like myself and Jeff. Uh, we have younger individuals. We have people that just started family. And as I mentioned earlier, this it's just the culture. I think everyone looks out for each other. And, you know, I've had a couple of instances where, you know, kids have gotten sick or have had emergencies and, and you know, the, the attendings, the faculty have no problem, um, you know, kind of accommodating those requests, especially when they're, you know, emergent and kind of like short notice. Um, so I feel like it's, it's a very family friendly program. And one thing I think is neat is that some attendings even ask how my kids are and, you know, they know their names and it's just, so they really take, uh, like I said, there's this culture where they really uh, pride themselves on the residents and, and kind of looking out after them, not only in education, but their well-being. And so very family friendly. I think my my family loves, you know, like I said, uh, loves being here in Atlanta and like they've had no issues kind of adjusting. We got to meet some of the residents uh, and hopefully more throughout the years, but, you know, they have no qualms with it. And I think it's just a great uh, program uh, as far as moonlighting. So moonlighting uh, just got reinstituted uh, over the probably the last year uh, due to COVID restrictions. And 
there's a number of moonlighting types of opportunities that are available. Uh, typically, as you start your second year, maybe even if towards the end of first year with contrast, but uh, the two types are basically dictation and contrast. Uh, contrast is just where you kind of, you're at the scanner and you're kind of uh, just watching over the studies, making sure that there's no uh, uh, reactions to contrast or extravasations. And you're really, you're sitting in a room kind of, you can, you can use that time to study or however you'd like to do. But uh, these, there could be short contrast uh, sort of um, terms where you base like an hour to three hours, or you can have like 12 hour contrast. And those are kind of nice. It uh, gives you time to catch up with the week, things like emails and stuff, but that's one type. And then the other type is a dictation types where you're actually having shifts where you can have anywhere from eight to 12 hours and you're dictating prelims or working at a, the hospitals like Grady or Midtown. Um, and, and they're both good opportunities. I take it as a, you know, you're getting paid to learn sort of thing, but at the same time, you're also getting extra opportunities to learn and, you know, get, make some extra money. So there, it's great opportunities. I think it's also a strength of our program. Um, but yeah, if there's any other questions on the types of moonlighting specifically, you know, I'd be happy to answer those. And I think everyone can, can chime in as well. But thanks, Julie. Awesome. Thank you, Carlos. And I'm just going to piggyback on that. Um, you know, I actually had a baby last year. Um, and I knew that we were in a supportive residency, but I don't think I really understood that until um, the little one arrived. And just, you know, from attendings giving us hand-me-downs to people just checking in periodically to see how I was doing, I was just really, really impressed at um, just how committed everyone is to you know, resident wellness and the family atmosphere here. But I don't want to talk too much, so I'm going to move on to Shanice. Um, I think, Jeff, you answered all your questions in one. I mean, like, I don't even have any more questions for you. I'm sorry. Um, but you can definitely ju uh, jump in if you have anything to add on the rest of these questions. Um, Shanice, do you anticipate any changes to the program or hospital in the next few years? And Dr. Ho, if you want to comment on that question too, feel free. Okay, so... Um... I don't think there are any major changes. One of the smaller changes that we made is um, just because we want to make sure that residents are having a well-rounded and robust experience um, at Grady. We're increasing some of the, the number of people that are overnight on call at Grady or well, their moonlighting opportunities at Grady, which is new for residents. And then um, they're moving to a point where we may have 24-hour um, attending coverage at Grady. Um, again, it'll still feel like independent call. You're still reading through studies and the attending may not catch up to you um, because you're putting in prelims, um, but that's just to help with the, um, the overnight study um, turnaround time, um, just to make sure that everything's being done uh, quickly and uh, you can best manage all of our patients overnight, but that should not feel like a big substantive change to, um, to anyone's training. So I don't think that there are any other major changes. I don't know if Dr. Ho had any other things that he's aware of? <laughs> no, no, I agree with you. Uh, nothing that no major changes expected within the program or the leadership of the program. Um, new things that have happened is really the development of these tracks. And really most of it is you'll see why, we, you know, why we have so many tracks. You're not required to be on a track as a resident, um, but really they exist there so that you can really have a well-rounded training experience. So not only will you be an amazing radiologist by the time you're done, but you'll have learned another skill set that will kind of help you in your career. Uh, and, you know, whether or not you stay in academics or do private practice, that's not the point. But really, the point is just to give you that experience so that you'll be ready for anything by the time you're done with us. Great. Thank you, Shanice and Dr. Ho. Um, we're going to move on to Jim slash Russell slash me. Um, what is the chance for couples match at your program? Hey, uh, this is Jim. I don't think I've had a chance to introduce myself, but I can answer this for, for a moment. Um, so uh, my fiance and I, we didn't do a traditional couples match. She was actually a year behind me and um, she was in a different specialty. Um, but the department here was very facilitative and communicative with the department that she's in and uh, they were able to work with us. And so um, I would say that there's, you know, a good chance um, for that opportunity if that's something that you're looking for um, doing uh, during your match cycle. Uh, the other advantage for Emory, not just for radiology, is that um, it sort of monopolizes all the residencies in this area, and we have very large program sizes for all the departments, not just radiology. 
Um, and so that also increases, you know, chances for doing that, especially if um, the significant other is in a different specialty. So I think um, this was probably one of the, the, the best opportunities for us to do that. And the, uh, in addition to that, the department was extremely helpful in sort of helping, you know, um, reach out to the, the other department um, that my uh, significant other was applying to, to, you know, let them know that, hey, like this, uh, this individual is applying and to keep an eye out and things like that. So I uh, was very appreciative of that. From a program director's perspective, I could just say really quick, um, we, amongst all the program directors at Emory talk to each other. So if I'm interviewing someone that I know is a couples match, I'll reach out to that other program, anesthesia, peds, medicine, whatever it is, and say, hey, we're interviewing so-and-so. Can you um, please look at so-and-so's uh, couples application if you haven't already? And then same thing, they'll, they'll send me those same uh, in, invitations as well. Uh, we have had a couple um, in the past, a dual radiology match, couples match to our program too. So uh, it's definitely possible. We, uh, we understand how difficult couples matching already is. So we try to help out the best we can. Great, thanks so much. Um, we will move on to Scott. Uh, Scott, what is your favorite thing about Emory's radiology program? Hey, sorry, I was just uh, answering a question there in the chat. Um, so I think what really, um, what really drew me here was after my interview day and just during my interview day, it was one of the few places where I talked with all of my, all of the attendings and the chief resident, like in my interviews, and I just felt uh, like everybody was very personable and very professional. Um, seemed happy uh you know just i had really good interactions with everybody on my interview day um and that really it just stood out from all of my other interviews um and so with that being said i think you know just the fact that our faculty and program directors truly care about us and listen to us uh you know this is a when people say resident run program what we really mean is that uh we're listened to and if we feel like changes need to be made uh you know, they're made. Um, we control the sort of major aspects of this program and it's like a self-governance uh, kind of thing. And we really have that here. So uh, another thing uh, is the social life. We have a big program and I, you know, I love hanging out with people, uh, you know, going out, um, you know, pre-COVID pre it was, we had monthly socials now, as we all are getting a little more vaccinated. Unfortunately, with the Delta wave uh, that's happened, it's it really put a damper on a lot of our plans. Um, but there was a little point in time where you know, cases were very low and then things were looking great. We had some socials and it was really fun again, uh, but I'm sure that they're gonna come back. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was such a big program. You'll, you'll find the people that you, that you mesh well with uh, your friend group, uh, if you wanna make friends with the people that you work with. Um, and uh, as well, the variety, I think that, I don't think there's anywhere else in the country truly that has the variety that we have in this program in terms of the amount of different pathologies that you see and the number of different practice settings that you work in. I mean, we have, you know, the big transplant hospital with complex inpatient med surge. Uh, we've got high volume outpatient MSK MRI and, you know, nice outpatient procedure rotations, body outpatient fluoro. Um, you know, we've got IR both in like a private practice setting at the St. Joe's. Is it St. Joe's, Julie? Uh, that the IR yep, rotation? St. Joe's. Yeah, I think it's more for like the, the IR residents, uh, but um that's like a really nice rotation i hear um uh, that's like private practice ir uh we have the va there's the huge level one trauma stroke center that is grady i mean literally anywhere you could pot any kind of setting that you can imagine working in you'll work in it so i think that's great not only in that uh, you get that great training experience but also you will get a very good sense of what kind of radiologist you want to be and what kind of place you like working the most. Um, 
in your training here, which is going to be immensely helpful uh, when you try to figure out what you want to do in your early career. Awesome. Well, we want to be respectful of everybody's time. We appreciate y'all, um, you know, staying a little bit over. Um, I'm going to ask the residents and I will as well. Um, and if any of the faculty still logged on would like to put your emails into the chats. Um, that way, if y'all have any specific questions, you're more than welcome to reach out to us. Um, we wish you the best of luck uh, during this interview season. And we really appreciate you taking the time to get to know our program better. Yeah, thank you all. Um, it was really nice to seeing everyone and spend a little bit of time this afternoon with everybody. Please feel free to reach out to any of us with questions. Well, thank you again for everyone um, joining faculty, residents. Um, I think it speaks a lot for people spend their Saturday afternoons with us, even while on call at Grady. So I appreciate everyone's attention um, and Always feel free to reach out to us. I look forward to meeting you all, hopefully during the interview season. Uh, and thanks again for all your great questions. And thanks to the residents. I promise I didn't pay them to say those nice things about the program or about myself, um, but really this is a family and I'm, I'm so proud of everything they do. Uh, so thanks again and uh, good luck this year, everyone. See you guys, thanks for coming. Thanks residents for participating. It was awesome. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.